I was very inspired uh, when I was a young man by a painter called William de Kooning. He was a stowaway from the Netherlands. He stowed away in the, in the uh, luggage area of a, of a ship and he arrived in New York and he was so poor that he had to buy black house paint. So that's why for the first couple of years all of his work was black and white. Um, his work is like none other. There's never, there, there was never anyone like him and there's never been anyone like him since. Back when I was young, there was not a word that existed for gay man. And growing up in the 50s and 60s, I, I did receive a lot of um, uh, bullying and abuse. And uh, sometimes I didn't even want to leave the house. But I had a lot of love with my family and uh, very nice friends. But one time I was in the uh, basement, the first floor of North High School, and two guys were calling me the old names, uh, bad names. And there was a... Uh, math professor, his name was John McCarthy, and he came over, he told them to uh, hit the road or he'd kick him in the rear end. And he turned to me and he said, I, I wanna share something with you. And I said, what? And he said, um, a famous American said it. Uh, you, uh, you not only have the right to be an individual, you have a responsibility to be an individual. And he said, do you know who said that? And I said, I don't. And he said, come back to me later today and find out who said that. So I went, I went to, it meant so much to me. And I went to the library, it was said by Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, you had, not only do you have a right to be an individual, you have a responsibility. Think of, think of uh, the, a thought as the mind's way of sweating. A thought is the mind's way of releasing stress. Isn't that amazing? So people who, th who are overthinking, they're just under a lot of stress. And so what they're doing is, is they start thinking about, oh my God, I'm thinking this thought and this is a bad thought and, they, and it just becomes, so you're getting more and more stressed. So if, can you imagine if you were on a treadmill and you just kept going, you kept going and you just were kept chasing it and chasing it and chasing it? You'd like, you'd probably eventually have a heart attack. Sure. So a thought is literally just the mind's way of releasing stress. So, the, so in, an, in a meditation session, you shouldn't be mad if you have a lot of thoughts because it is a, it is a wonderful thing it's an absolutely wonderful thing because it's your mind's way of releasing the stress that you have because you're obviously 
think compulsively thinking and that mind needs to get rid of it to let it go let it flow and then it'll always be there but it'll be there as a little distant murmur and and it's 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 like i said I, why i am so um so enthusiastic about it is because of what it did it transformed my life Welcome to episode 99 of American Real, where this week we bring you artist Robert Hoover, who just completed his 20th First Friday art exhibition. Robert began painting 13 years ago after having an intense dream of painting a canvas. The next morning, he told himself he had to start painting and hasn't looked back since. A majority of his works are captivating abstract acrylic on canvas with intense colors and lines. He also creates collages and portraits in his very unique style. Robert talks about a successful career being all about relationships, and he would know. After working more than three decades in the cutthroat magazine industry in New York City, Robert worked for top publications such as Cosmopolitan, Esquire, and O, to name a few. He retired in January of 2016 after moving back to his hometown of Binghamton, New York in 2010. This is a story of a man who overcame adversity in his life, yet persevered, finding joy in his family and passion through his expression of artwork, as he describes being modern and free. So sit back and relax as I welcome Mr. Robert Hoover. This is American Real. I am Roger Brooks. My guest today is Robert Hoover. You are a professional and a gentleman and you advocate that a successful career is all about relationships. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roger. I appreciate it. I am just amazed by your talent of your artistry. Your artwork has, it, ca it captivates me. I don't know if it's the colors, the style. How would you describe your artwork? Um, I would uh, say one word, free. Uh, it's very important that my work be free and uh, uh, honest. And uh, most of my work is about my emotional and sensual experiences. And I try to uh, put it down in a visual way with an informed and intelligent mind. And um, uh, mostly my art is uh, acrylic on canvas, I'd say 90%. Okay. Um, I also do a little collage, and that ties into when I started the magazine industry as an art director, we used to paste everything up on the board. So when you do a collage, you're pasting everything up. And I also do portraits, which we can talk about later. Sure. And... Um, uh, I would say my work is modern, and um, as I said before, free. So the first question that comes to my mind is, if you started painting early on in your career, do you think the art would be the same? Yes, yeah, yeah. The, um, I. Uh, was an English lit major in college, and I, I didn't have a declared minor in art, but I went to summer school for three summers and squeezed in beginning drawing, intermediate drawing, uh, beginning painting, and I also took an art history course with a very famous um, a man called uh, Ken Lindsay. He was one of the military men I don't know if you know the story about that. He was one of, one of about eight art history prof, uh, professionals that went to Europe and saved about 40 or 50 masterpieces from yes. the Nazis. Okay, I do recall so, this, yes. So, so anyway, um, um, when I first moved to New York after graduating, I, I used to go to a Saturday drawing class. And, and then as my responsibilities in, in magazine grew, uh, I had less time. So I always loved art, went to museums, and uh, 
I sketched a little bit, but uh, it didn't pick up until later. But I just wonder, all of your years of experience, I feel that that's what you're pouring into your work today. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I told you out in the hall that um, there's a, a very deep emotional well that I have from my life. So uh, I jump into that, <laughs> into that pool, into that well, whenever I need inspiration. You and I have a mutual friend, uh, Anthony Brunelli, who we also had on the show. And uh, he talks about something called flow state when he's in his groove in a painting that there's just this flow state that um, just puts him at a, at a different place. Is that, is that what you're referring to? I think so. Um, the, the one thing that I always noticed about painting is that time stands still. Um, I, I totally have no conception of time. Like, sometimes I'll paint for four or five hours and I look up and I can't believe what time it is. Uh, I just totally... You're immersed in, in, in it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I totally, it totally takes you to a different place. Great. Yeah. Well, I want to talk more about your technique and all that in a little bit, but uh, I would like to ask you and really start our conversation um, about talking about your highly successful 20th Binghamton Art Walk First Friday uh, that you have. Um, I would think that that may be a record for, for our, at least for our area, uh, 20 exhibits. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Well, it, uh, when, when I relocated back here in 2010, um, I was done with the magazine industry and um, I, I really had no interest in exhibiting. And a friend of mine, um, Cassie Murphy, and her partner, Laura Holmes, had a dress store on Court Street. And they said, why don't you do a First Friday? So I went to um, uh, Taylor Rentals on Upper Front Street and rented like 10 easels. And, and I put my work in, it was a big hit. And so I, I, I did one called uh, uh, Modern Portraits, the second was absolutely abstract, and the third was uh, collage. And uh, uh, they were very well attended. And when you exhibit your work, you change. It, it gives you confidence. It, it, it just changes. It makes you a better person, I think, better artist. Sure. So then the very next one I had was uh, at a restaurant that had just opened uh, Burger Mondays. Matt Jones owns it. Uh, excellent food, but he had just opened it. And uh, about the time that I had my first Friday there, um, uh, I was kind of the it thing at, the, at that moment. Like my, my name was everywhere. And um, time stood still. It was a sensation. It was packed. I'm like, we could have gotten in trouble how crowded it was. The, the, the Over new, the fire code. Absolutely. <laughs> right. the, the, the newly uh, hired president of Binghamton new University, Harvey Stinger, arrived with a busload of students and walked in and saw how crowded it was and <laughs> walked out. It was packed, and I sold eight right off the walls. Wow. That was, that was a record for me. That's incredible. And it was just, of course, I went back the next day and replaced them, but um, it, was, uh, it was really exciting. And then I, I had, uh, I think, three or four more there. And then I went to um, Lost Dog Cafe. Um, Marie and Liz that own it are, are dear friends of mine now. And then I was asked by Tranquil uh, Bistro, um, uh, very nice people, and uh, having an exhibit there to me felt like having an exhibit in Paris with the brick walls. And it was, uh, I had, I think, three there. And one of them, uh, this was a record, they asked me to keep it up two more months. So I was there actually three months. Oh. Now that didn't count as three in my total of 20, but uh, I had to go back and put more tape on the title cards because that's a long time. Yeah. What an honor. 
it, it was nice, and they're such nice people. And then I went to um, uh, Water Street Brewing Company, and I was their very first, first Friday. Michelle and John uh, uh, built it from scratch, a Likert, and uh, uh, they were so sweet. They, they actually ran five ads in the Binghamton Press for color. Promoting it. Uh, and it was so nice. And it was, it was terrific, uh, it was very widely attended. And then I had um, another one, um, what am I forgetting? I think, that was, I think that was it, but I repeated at those places. I see. And um, several years I would have three. I would have like uh, one in March, one in August, and then one in December. So uh, when, when I reached 20, uh, the exhibit's still up at the, as we speak. Um, it was mind blowing. That's phenomenal. Yeah. So let's talk about actually selling a piece. What does that mean to you? First of all, how do you assign a value? People that don't really understand mm -hmm. the art world. Who, who, who puts the value on? Is that something you do? And how, how do you come up with that? Well, <clears throat> uh, my work is very affordable. Like the, uh, uh, compared to other artists, can my contemporaries, my work is usually about 150. And, and what size is that? Um, that? That's about the largest that I do. I have two that are a little bit larger than that, but um, I'm comfortable with 16 by 20, 18 by 24 is about my size. And um, uh, the only ones that are marked real high are ones that I don't want to sell. That, so I mark them high so no one will buy them. But um, very often, <clears throat> if, if I meet someone at an exhibit or I meet with them later uh, and I like them, I'll give them a 30% discount. And, and if you're a friend of mine uh, or someone I went to school with, I'll probably cut, it, cut the price in half. Wow. And, and I thought it was tacky to have prices on the title cards. I didn't like that. And so a lot of people said, there's no prices. And I said, yeah, it's got my Etsy online storefront, like take your phone out or your laptop at home and you'll find out how much it is. And but you price them affordably. So, uh, yes, I do. So they move. And how does it make you feel when someone makes the purchase and then it, owns that piece? It, it makes me feel terrific. Uh, very often when someone buys one, they'll quickly buy a second one and very often a third one. And... Um, I'm fortunately very comfortable now financially, and I really don't care if, if I sell any. So <laughs> that's wonderful. But, but I do like uh, uh, that they find new homes. Yeah. Um, and I, every time I give someone a tour of an exhibit, each painting has a backstory. Every single one. Um, Can you give us an example? Well, for example, there's a painting uh, in the current exhibit called The Ghost of Elvis. And when I did it, I was very inspired by <clears throat> a pop song by Michael or Mark Cohn called Walking in Memphis. Are you familiar with sure. that? And to be honest, I heard it, but Cher uh, did a cover of it three years later with the exact same arrangement. And I'm a big fan of hers. Uh, and so I, I, I get goosebumps whenever I hear the song, uh, how he discovered himself through the process of discovering Memphis and Elvis. And so I did it, and it was on an easel in my apartment, and my nephew Bobby and his family came over, and his uh, six-year-old son Craig kept standing in front of it saying, Uncle Bob, how come, how come there's six of them? And his, his mother said, because he's a ghost. And um, I found out later that when he was born, he was an identical twin. Mm. And the twin died at birth. So that adds another dimension. He might have had a ghost. Right. Um, I was referring to the ghost of, in the Mark Cohn lyric. Right. But uh, when, when people hear that, hear the story, they they look at it in a different way. Now, where is that painting? Did someone purchase that? No, no, that, that's that. still still available. So that's one that has the higher price on it? No, 
No, the, the, the higher priced one, there's one I did of Barbara Streisand called Yentl. Okay. That, that has a big story for me. And, and that I, I marked real, because I, I really don't want to uh, sell that. But I have it on my storefront. And um, th there's another painting, uh, getting into your question, it, it's called The Blue Wave. Now that's not about uh, the Democratic Party uh, in next year's election, although it could be. But um, uh, it's, it's from the perspective of someone that has just survived a shipwreck. Okay. And they're hanging on to a, a, a piece of wood and it shows you how powerful the sea is. And if you really stand in front of that, knowing that perspective, you, you, almost, <laughs> you almost have a panic attack because the sea is just so powerful uh, and it's just moving. And um, I, I even put the colors that you see in, in a prism. You, you know, when you see blue and yellow and green, I, I, I really worked at it. So I think knowing that what the perspective is adds to the enjoyment. And furthermore, I believe that the creative act that the artist does is the same for all the arts. The, the exact same thing. It's just different form. Right. And I also believe with painting that um, the audience completes the creative act, not the artist. So, so I could do a painting, but if no one saw, sees them, it's not the creative act is not finished. I love that perspective. Same with theater. You could have a guy write a play, <clears throat> you could hire a director and actors and they rehearse, but until the audience comes in, it's not theater. So, And really, now that you say that, almost any type of art. Someone writes a book. If you don't have anyone Absolutely. reading the book, it's not complete. I was at a uh, workshop that you gave about, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, Be Unstoppable. Uh, Be Unstoppable. And when you were talking how you have a passion for writing a novel, did you hear me? I said, I said you're an artist. That's it's right. the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, blank canvas, blank page, right. blank screen. Um, and it comes from in here and, and up here. It's your experience. Robert, let's talk about your, the influence. Where did your influence come from? What artists did you aspire to be or look up to? I was very inspired uh, when I was a young man by a painter called William de Kooning. He's one of the, the, the uh, hallmarks of abstract expressionism. He was a stowaway from the Netherlands. He stowed away in the, in the uh, luggage area of a, of a ship in, in the wow. 40s and um, uh, with just the clothes on his back. And he arrived in New York and he was so poor that he had to buy black house paint. So that's why for the first couple of years, all of his work was black and white. Um, his work is like none other. There's never, there, there was never anyone like him and there's never been anyone like him since. It, it was incredible if you ever look at his work. How did you become introduced to him? I went to the library and, uh, and there was a file cabinet with folders in it with, you know, little art books and brochures. And, and, and I pulled it out and I was just uh, thrilled when I saw his work. I still am. Uh, he was also very handsome. And his wife was also a painter, very good painter. And um, I was also inspired by a painter called Hans Hoffman. And uh, he... Uh, painted with a lot of red, and I love red. Um, just everything was uh, symmetrical and everything was, but it was very abstract. Um, I also liked uh, Mark Rothko. Uh, he's the one that paints, he was so original, like uh, he'll, he'll paint the top of the canvas pink and, and then just on the edge just have a little purple and then the bottom will just be gray. It, it, it's beautiful, and I guess his detractors said it was anyone could do it, but he is the one that made millions of dollars. Beautiful. Um, of course, I loved Andy Warhol. I, I loved one of uh, my favorites. He he was 
so incredibly ahead of his time. Uh, he, he kind of presaged, predicted uh, the influence of computers and pop, uh, popular culture on us. And um, I remember one time I was in the Dallas Museum of Art and back to Elvis, he, he's got a painting there called Blue Elvis and it's, it's lifelike, it's, it's like seven feet tall. And I, I just got close to it and I almost started crying because it was so beautifully painted. Now that's something that not everyone notices, but when you're a painter, you see that the brush strokes were all exactly painted. It was absolutely beautiful. And what about that makes you emotional? Because you, you understand the level of dedication for that masterpiece to come to life? Is that what it is? It, it, it was just painted so meticulously, so exactly, like, like all, the, all the strokes were exactly right. Now you can still see that it's hand painted and it was oil, uh, but it was absolutely beautiful. And what he did, which no one ever did before, is he would uh, take a Polaroid or a vintage photograph and he would send it to his lithographer who would silk screen it to a canvas. So in a way he was coloring it with paint, but unlike anyone else. And he was totally ahead of his time. And this blue Elvis is, is I, I think he's in a cowboy outfit and it's obviously blue, a couple of shades of blue, beautiful. So I'm interested to know about your work because you have a, a background in graphic art. How do you incorporate that into your work? Are you doing similar things? Are you working on the computer and then actually painting or is everything happening on the computer? What, no. what, what is, can you please explain? Because my, my sister is also an artist and okay. she was trying to figure out how, how you were getting the end result, which was remarkable. Uh, the, um, the portraits, which we can talk about at some point, that the, the portraits how I, is how I got noticed. That's how I got uh, attention. Uh, my passion is abstract. That, that's what, what I'm inspired by. Maybe because uh, I understand the chaos and, and um, it, it just makes sense to me. But the portraits, I start out with the photograph and I study it. And, and the reason that um, I don't do that many of them um, now, I, I do once in a while because everyone loves them so much, is they take forever because they're very exacting. It's freehand? Well, well yeah. Yeah, I study, I study the photograph. I mean, you wouldn't believe how much I study it. I mean, I could <laughs> draw it in my, in my sleep. I just study. I, I have to find the right photograph usually black and white, and I just study it. And then I do a sketch right on the canvas. And sometimes I do it on a big, uh, like 18 by 24 sheet of paper. And are you using a ruler because your lines are so perfect? Well, the, um, I was trained on a, on a drafting board with a T-square and a triangle and, and, a, and rulers and so on and so forth. But, but no, I, um, I use the computer to study it and, and what I do is uh, I'll do the sketch and then I'll go back and I'll make corrections because I want it perfect, absolutely perfect uh, anatomically. Uh, and um, When you say it takes a long time, how long would a portrait typically oh, take? Uh, weeks. Wow. Um, and um, also the reason I like black and white is because I like really good lighting. Uh, like, I, I tried for a while, because people liked my portraits, to do commission portraits, but I got, uh, trying to think of a, a, a nice word, uh, I got um, cheated, how said, many, many times. They because didn't of the like amount it. of time, or, or they, they weren't. They didn't you know, like it, yeah. they wanted me to redo it, uh, and it took so long, so, so I stopped doing commission portraits. And that's a good point, because one of the things I've noticed is that, obviously, Art is everyone's own taste and their own interpretation, something that might be beautiful to you, Blue Elvis. Someone else may look at it and not appreciate it. So is art 
a matter of really understanding it. So for the novice, you know, maybe these portraits that you did that people said they didn't like, they were brilliant. But the person was expecting something else and therefore they, they didn't like it. Is that because of lack of experience in understanding art? No. Is, is there a maturity to art? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to compare it to something well, else. Um, I, I think in the uh, short-lived uh, commissioned portraiture that I did, um, it wasn't that, it's, it, was, it was just painful because the photographs did not have proper lighting. And, and sometimes I, I did a portrait of Al Pacino. It was the best light available. Uh, I did one of Tulula Bankhead. I mean, it was done by a famous, famous photographer. And so the lighting was sensational. And for me, that's the exciting part of doing a portrait is, is like the little shadow here and how one section is light, one section is dark. And um, the people that didn't like it, uh, they, they were just being mean. They were just being difficult. So I just stopped it. But a lot of it has to do with the quality of the original image. Exactly. exactly. Of, One person that I did, the, the photographs were so bad that I had to come with my camera and shoot it myself. Wow. I literally had to go and convert it to black and white and use that as my model. Because you need a model for when you do a portrait, mm -hmm. a reference. Mm -hmm. Uh, you stated that painting portraits helped you get attention. We talked about that. It that did. That's what kind of jump-started right, your, your career. The, the one I did of Edith Piaf was, was a, uh, uh, very widely received. And I did another of George Gershwin. That I still love it to this day. Uh, somebody here in the Triple Cities owns it. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, so let's go back in time. Tell us about how you ended up in New York and began your career in the magazine industry. Yeah. Well, uh, I can start with high school. I was um, the editor-in-chief of my yearbook. So when I went to New York, <clears throat> I simultaneously applied to television magazines, uh, book, book publishing, and advertising, and magazine came to me first. And I knew how to do layout, I knew how to do paste ups, I knew how to physically get a book out. It's not easy uh, to meet four or five deadlines, um, a book that size. And so that's how I started. But um, in um, growing up, I think I told you, in, in the emails that we exchanged, that uh, back when I was young, there was not a word that existed for gay man. And growing up in the 50s and 60s, I, I did receive a lot of um, uh, bullying and abuse. And uh, sometimes I didn't even want to leave the house. But I had a lot of love with my family and uh, very nice friends. And, uh, I can share something with you. I don't want to get emotional, but one time I was in the uh, basement, the first floor of North High School, and two guys were calling me, the old names, uh, bad names, and there was a uh, math professor. His name was John McCarthy. He was also a football coach and a track coach, and he came over. He told them to uh, hit the road or he'd kick him in the rear end, and he turned to me and he said, I, I want to share something with you. And I said, what? And he said, um, a famous American said it. Uh, you, uh, you not only have the right to be an individual, you have a responsibility to be an individual. And he said, do you know who said that? And I said, I don't. And he said, come back to me later today and find out who said that. So I went, I went to, it meant so much to me. And I went to the library, it was said by Eleanor Roosevelt. You had, not only do you have a right to be an individual, you have a responsibility. I love so, that. So that was very, uh, very interesting. My mother was incredibly supportive of, of, of me, more than anyone. So when people ask me why uh, I was a success, I go, there's a woman behind every man, and it was her. Wow. 
and the John McCarthy's that, that oh, also he, stood behind you, right? And, and that was amazing. That 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 was probably needed for you at, at that at that. That was amazing. Moment. There 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 were others. There were other uh, nice people, but uh, so uh, by the time I got in high school, I was a lot stronger. Um, facing adversity, uh, but of course, you know, it would have been nicer without it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I wanted to make a silk purse out of a pig's ear, you know, I wanted to make the most of it. it worked out fine. So by the time I um, uh, went to college, uh, that was the uh, start of women's lib, uh, black lib, and gay lib. So when I went to school, there was none of that uh, at all, period. So it, college to me, and that's why I do so much volunteer work for them and have for the last 35 years, it was the uh, happiest time of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, really, really. Wanted, and I'm still friends with everyone that I was friends with in college. And it was a very, very, very happy time. And I did take uh, beginning drawing, as I said, and, couple of courses, and I loved English Lit. And it, it helps me come up with really unique titles for my paintings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into being an individual, being yourself, coming into your own. I was reading something today, actually this morning, and it made me think of you. If you don't mind, I'll just read it to you. It says, relax your grip. Let the world do whatever it likes. Give yourself permission to be yourself and allow others to be different. Don't compare yourself to anyone. Don't get too attached to anything. Accept things with grace and let them go with grace. I thought about you. It's very nice. Thank you. I'm, I'm very flattered. The, 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 the point of, of life, I think, is to learn. And, and to love and be loved. But um, I'm still inspired. Like I mentioned Hans Hoffman and William de Kooning, and I was going to mention Picasso, too. There's also an artist here in Binghamton that, that I helped get started. Her name is Teresa Arcodia, and she's doing such beautiful work. And she likes to work very large. Uh, the, the colors, the passion, and I think she, she must have a deep emotional well to tap into as well. But her work is beautiful if anyone wants to look it up. And what's great about all this, and it's just kind of connecting with me now, is that we as individuals express ourselves in life in our own way. And it's very much so like artwork. I mean, every artist is Absolutely. different. You express yourself differently. And isn't it so wonderful that someone like this woman that you mentioned and, and any artist out there, when they get into their own, whether it's photography, whether it's painting, whatever it may be, um, it's just a, it, it's an expression of you. Yeah, absolutely. It's so much fun um, uh, painting. And now that I'm retired, I can do it whenever the blank I want. I can do it whenever I want, or I don't have to do it. But um, um, at the exhibit that's up right now, uh, at Lost Dog, they have this area in the venue called the Red Half Wall. Are, are you familiar? Yes. Well, um, I created six paintings especially for that Red Half Wall. Wow. And that was something new. Uh, I wanted them horizontal, and I had never painted sunsets before. So it was a departure for me. And um, even though I'm a canvas guy, I chose very expensive watercolor paper. And I painted acrylic right on it. And of course, it just sucked it up. And they came out uh, so well. And, and uh, there was a, they're a very big hit. And they looked so clean on that red half wall. And th they didn't have the steel uh, uh, canvas holders. Um, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Because you, a person is always learning. Sure. You mentioned you like red. Um, you're wearing a red tie. And I understand that that tie has some meaning. Tell us about that. Well, when, when I took beginning painting at 
we used to call it Harper, Binghamton University. Um, I took it at a summer course, as a summer course, summer semester. And uh, that's a real treat if, if anyone has the ability to just take one course over the summer, because it's a very short semester. The teachers come in with t-shirts and jeans on, and you get the same experience that you do going five months. But um, it, so anyway, here I am, and the teacher was called Al Love. <laughs> and, um, and he was totally free. He let us do whatever we wanted. Um, now in beginning painting, you have to learn how to, how to stretch and prime a canvas yourself, like with the wood. And um, I bought my canvas at Eureka Tent Nawning, stapling it, putting primer on. And uh, one of the last paintings I did was, was a, of a symbol. It was kind of a uh, graphic abstract. And the symbol was exactly the symbol. I still have it on my wall in my studio. The same symbol. And it was a symbol you created for yeah, the class? Yeah, just standing there. And, and I just kept repeating it. Um, it it's kind of an eye. Uh, it, it's almost like Japanese calligraphy. And, and, and it was je ne sais pas. And, and I just kept repeating it on this canvas. And then I went over it with uh, some light a paint that was watered down, almost like waves splashing into it. And, and uh, then about 30 years later, I saw this um, tie at Bergdorf's or Macy's or wherever I saw it, and I went, there it is. Isn't that so, yeah. But, but I think you're, uh, you're always learning, and I think you get signs, uh, little signs uh, as you go through life. For sure. You have, to look, you, have, you have to be looking for them, right? And be aware of them. Well, uh, people say that when you're sitting at home looking out a window and a cardinal comes mm -hmm. and pops down, that that uh, means that's someone that you've lost saying hello. Well, every day, I, I have my computer in front of a window. Every day, two cardinals come down. And they just sit. And it's in between an alleyway, in between home. They sit, and I see them. and. It's amazing. Now, that's interesting. I'd love to share a story with you. A um, good friend of mine passed very young. I believe oh, he was dear. 41 or 42 uh, a few years back. And I didn't know anything about the Cardinal story. But um, uh, I was, he lived in North Carolina. We were all getting ready to go down to the, to the funeral. And before I left, uh, a Cardinal came you know, in front of me, and it was very apparent, and, and, and I remembered it. Uh, when we all got down there, we all started sharing the cardinal stories. It happened to all of us, all oh of us close goodness. friends. And then we started doing some research and found out exactly what you said, that it has meaning. That yep. It has meaning. And again, just being aware and, and looking for those signs. And, and in, in a lot of ways, it gives me comfort uh, seeing a cardinal today, knowing that that's Mike, you know, that's, that's Mike Rayhor. And he's with us. He's still with us, and he's watching us. Yeah. Um, my, my sister had three kids, and um, we joked around when they were growing up um, that I was their third parent. Now, I was in New York, and they were up here, but I came home quite often because I uh, loved my parents, and, uh, and I loved those kids and, and, and their parents, my sister and her husband. But uh, those kids mean so much to me. I mean, we had so much fun, and, and they actually taught me the real meaning of love. It's, it's one thing for you to love someone, love deeply, but to be loved back um, is, makes it complete. And, and those kids are now um, happily married and having little kids of their own, so I've got little kids back in my life again. That's and, wonderful. And they're so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us some of the pros and cons of living in New York. Oh my goodness. I, I'm gonna have a sip of water for that. I, um, <laughs> the pros and cons of New York. <clears throat> God, do I remember that. Um, first of all, I wouldn't redo a thing. I, I had a blast. Uh, definitely one of the perks, uh, magazines, work was very interesting. And, um, 
I was always able to get the issue out. I, I used to joke that I was like a, a Jewish mother and a wizard and um, a lot of other anecdotes, but I was able to get it out. And um, uh, one of the big things about publishing is um, they, they sit around like they're Joe Cool all week long, and then when the de deadline's around, they're nuts. So Frantic. I was trying to teach them just to do a little bit of work each day, and that way the deadline, we can all leave at 5 o'clock instead of staying on midnight. So, so, but it was very interesting work. Um, also, the New York City theater, because I love live theater. I love musicals. So we could sit down. I saw just about every, <laughs> every musical and every play for 34 years, every one of them. What are some of your favorites? Oh, my goodness. Uh, the, it's just so, so many. Les um, Mis. Well, well, I, I loved Les Mis. Um, I loved um, Starlight Express. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It was all on a, on a uh, roller skating. And the characters were trains. It was really, really hmm. uh, amazing. Um, I liked the two revivals I saw of the classic musical Gypsy. Okay. It was very good. And... Um, uh, I, I can't think, I, I, I love them all. I love theater. And then um, later on, I, I discovered the world of off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. And you can go to that TKTS line and you can get a ticket for like $18 and uh, it's open seating. And probably remarkable talent. Exactly, because it costs so much to produce a Broadway play now. So off-Broadway really is the way to go. And, and you can study all the blurbs, uh, what's, what's available. And what's off-off-Broadway? Off-off-Broadway is like in the basement of a church on Ninth Avenue. And they're also excellent. It's young So it's people. really based on budget, right? The terms. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But um, I saw a lot, of, a lot of really good material in basements of churches off-off-Broadway that eventually got... No kidding. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, so a lot of them start that way. They start as off-Broadway. Uh, uh, there was a man with the last name Pap, Joe Pap, down, who had a place in uh, a theater in uh, Astor Place down in the village, the Shakespeare or something or other. I haven't done my research, but he started a lot. Of, like he, I think he started a chorus line there, and then it moved to Broadway from there. Incredible. Yeah, there were just so many, and so that certainly was a perk. The some of the cons were it was so expensive, and I moved to New York, and I'd come home after five years. And my uh, classmates were buying houses and having children, and had they'd have two cars already. And here I was scraping the money <laughs> to pay this exorbitant rent every month, and uh, uh, back in the late 70s, uh, we were scared because a lot of, this was before credit cards and before ATMs, and a lot of us weren't relying on our parents, and we were living paycheck to paycheck, and we were scared of getting fired, and the employers took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I managed. Um, let me see, uh, it was a little bit dangerous at times, but um, now again, back to the pro side, New York City is actually a, a, a conglomeration of a lot of little neighborhoods. There's the, the West Village, East Village, Chelsea, um, you know, the little, little Soho. sections. Soho, of yeah. course. Oh, I love Soho. Uh, and, and there was NYU, and there was a, uh, this, that, and the other thing. Midtown, um, see, a lot of people come to New York and they think Midtown is New York, it's not. There's so much more. And then there's different boroughs, and that, that's New York City too. Like the Bronx, the, that's where the Italians. Arthur for, Avenue. For, oh, absolutely. And then Queens, there's a lot of Turkish restaurants that are to die for. And um, Staten Island is also a trip. For, for When I was there, for a buck, you had the best ferry ride right past the Statue of Liberty. Wow. So, so you didn't have to pay all that money to, to go and. Uh, one of the expensive cruises by, you just take the Staten Island Ferry. 
And um, what am I forgetting? Brooklyn. Brooklyn, of course. Oh, oh my God. The pizza, the Italian food. Also, it's funny, for many years, I would have um, uh, assistants and workers. I, I developed a real talent at hiring good people. It, it didn't, uh, I had some growing pains, but I became very good at hiring people. What were you looking for? Uh, Robert Hoover Jr., someone that was just like me, someone who was really conscientious, uh, down to earth, and, um, but uh, I, I hired this woman, her name was Marilyn, and uh, she had <laughs> heavy duty New York City accent. And people would call, they'd be mad or something, and they, I want to talk to Robert Hoover. She'd say, he's in a meeting. She said, he's in, I'll have him call you back. And so I would say to her, um, I'd be really upset. And she'd say, Robert, have some coffee. <laughs> You'll feel better. And, and then I would say to her, um, Marilyn, what are you doing this weekend? She'd say, I'm going by my daughter's. She was going by her daughter's. So, so she, she taught me a lot, too. New York's tough. It, People are tough. It is. In, in, in publishing, um, I, I think I mentioned to you that one of the things I think that led to my success was I treated our vendors like they were business partners. And a lot of uh, people, I, I don't mean to badmouth magazine people, but a lot of them treated our vendors with contempt. Like, like somehow uh, they were these, these cool New Yorkers and there's these hicks down in uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and they were uh, less than human. Well, that's baloney. And I always treated them um, with respect. And I think they liked the upstate New York in me. And, and I, I realized, I, I think I learned it at college, all these people from, from New York thought they knew everything, and I had something that they didn't have. I was nice, genuinely nice. So that's what I would do. And so I would go to the printers to check the color to, to make sure that the cover was perfect. And uh, some of the first signatures were beautiful. And... Um, uh, I got to know all of them, and, and they fell in love with me. And uh, so, uh, invariably, the big bosses, the, the vice presidents of production, would, would hear feedback from the printers. They'd be having lunch with the New York City salesman for the plant down in Kentucky, and, and he'd say, God, they love Robert Hoover. And, and he would tell them, because he did this and we were in a bind and he said, no problem. And um, one time we were able to pay him back and so on and so forth. But, but I really, really genuinely liked these people. And I'd have to go down and spend three and four days, um, usually about four times a month. And um, it was a pleasure because they were so sweet and so nice. And, and they appreciated me because uh, there's an old Binghamton expression. I'm sure you've heard it. They, they say there's a lot of buttes out there. Right. <laughs> I thought you love that. Well, there were a lot of buttes in, in in the magazine industry, and I think I was just genuine and nice. What do you say to the people that say nice guys finish last? Um, I would tell them to think again. I would tell them that they're they're uh, they're vision is incomplete and that they need to think about it that more. Um, because nice guys can also be thoroughly researched and nice guys can also be very effective and, and nice guys can also be on top. Because I went from being an art director for a tiny little credit magazine all the way to a vice president and operations supervisor. Um, it was, a, it, it was a lot of fun. Um, I, I met a lot of nice people, fell in love a few times, and uh, uh, certainly had a blast. And music, there was concerts everywhere. There was just myriad things to do. And the, the museums. And, and I always kept up looking at uh, staying on top of contemporary art, like the Whitney, um, the Guggenheim, uh, 
show really cutting edge artwork, the Museum of Modern Art. Awesome. Robert, what does it take to be a success today? And first of all, what does that mean to you, success? And I'm really thinking about our younger people. Right. What advice would you give them? The, the advice I would give young people is, is um, um, if, if they're having problems, if they're having issues, and we all do, don't start drinking. Or, or just drink a little bit. I know a lot of people that can just have one glass of wine with dinner, maybe a second glass. Um, but don't get into it heavily because it, it's not good. Um, rather, uh, much more beneficial nowadays, there's always people to talk to. There's, there's 800 numbers. Uh, uh, if you're stressed out, you need to talk to someone. Uh, but don't suffer in silence and don't turn to alcohol and drugs because it's, it's nowhere. A lot of people have died from it. And um, like I said, if you're having problems, you, you gotta speak up. Just like when you're being bullied in high school, I told my nieces and nephews when they were little, um, try and handle it yourself and say, stop. And if they keep it up, say, go pick on someone else. And if they keep it up, say, I'm, I'm going to the principal, I'm going to the counselor. And I go, and if that doesn't work, go to your parents. And this is when they would laugh. I would say, or you call me. Like the movie. So Uncle they had options. You gave them a lot of Ab options to think absolutely. about. Try it myself. Try and handle it yourself. Right. Yeah. If like, not, go to a teacher. Go to your parents. Go to an aunt or an uncle. Go to Uncle Bob, who will walk in like, <laughs> like a John Good. What was his name? Uh, John Candy and Uncle Buck. <laughs> right. Where he, where he flips the quarter and finds a rat or <laughs> to gnaw that thing off so your chest. No. And they laughed because I would have. Yeah. Now they went to Windsor High School. I <laughs> when they came walking, I would have found the guy that was a girl that was that was uh, uh, bullying them, and I <laughs> told them a thing or two. So um, uh, the, the other advice that would be, uh, how do we get started? Is is um, uh, be true to yourself. That reading you uh, you quoted was wonderful. Um, uh, Read, 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 and, and do more reading. I'm at the point now where if someone recommends a book and I, I give it 50 pages, if, if I don't, I'm not get that. Go on to the next. It stinks. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if I get into it, I always get something out of it. And also reading essays. Um, that's a real overlooked genre. Um, what do you recommend? Oh, there's, there's just about every field. Uh, I, I got a book, uh, uh, it was essays by, by gay men about the relationships with their father. And it was entitled, uh, the, something, the, the Man I Could Be, or The Man I, I Could, the, the Man I Could Be. It was about the relationship with their parents. And there were maybe 40 of them. And some of those, and I went to the next one. Some of them were just beautiful, just incredible. And from every different perspective that you can think of. So if you read 30 essays, you're going to get a pretty good understanding of that kind of thinking. Like this one, this one guy, I wrote to him. It was so hilarious. It was called Daddy Was a Hottie. Like his father was really good looking. And, and he remembered being in the pool and swimming underneath his legs. And, um, it was so nice that I bought my uh, present healthcare professional a copy of it because he liked the sounds of it. And, and also I did a painting that inspired me. Um, and the other advice I would give kids is um, um, keep a journal. Why? It, it, keep, um, keep a record of your thoughts, uh, especially when you start a new experience or a new job. Like write down how you're feeling because in six months, when you're more well adjusted, you can look back and see how you've grown. And that's very important to see how you've grown. That can help you in the future. Because sometimes it's hard to see ourselves grow, right? Sometimes it's hard to even notice well, because it's 
daily progression, whereas if you look back three months, six months, you could see, wow. Well, yeah, you, you feel so awkward. And, right. and, and, and sometimes people don't make it much easier either. But uh, keep in a journal, read, um, uh, uh, get out there and talk to people. And uh, I, I'm sure I have further advice. Oh, I seek out. Seek out people in your field of interest. That like are a well mentor? Not, they will always, uh, always that, give I think advice. that's so underestimated Absolutely. by people. People are afraid to reach out to others. And in my experience, when I've reached out to people, they've been, you know, more than happy to help. Yeah. And people feel honored. And, and, I, and I love yes. doing the same to pass that on. When, when people reach out to me, I want to help as much as I can. And so I, I, I'm glad you said that because yeah. it, it is something that I think more young people need to be comfortable doing. And, and one thing I think that's important is when you uh, used to be in the old days, you would send a beautiful card or a beautiful hand typed or a handwritten letter. Uh, now I guess that's passe. Um, but when you send an email, don't ask for anything. Like don't, it'll turn them off if you're trying to find a job even though you might want a job in their company. Don't... Uh, so be smart about it. Ask for advice. Mm -hmm. I just say, I'm, I'm just writing you because I wonder if you have 30 seconds uh, to answer a couple of questions. And most of them will let you come in if, if they get a good Shadow sense. Them. Yeah. I used to have... I used to let Binghamton students uh, come to my office if I had a good feeling. And I'd schedule their their interview to come and talk to me around 11 o'clock. And if I liked them, I'd take them to lunch. I'd leave lunch open that day. And they were thrilled. And I'd take them to a really nice restaurant. But um, uh, I think the advice strategy, that's what it's called, don't, because uh, it turns them off if, if you're trying to weasel uh, something out of them, just ask for advice. and. Um, now, I had one young person in my life uh, who shall remain nameless, but I was with him since the very beginning. And, and I told him, when you get your first job um, and you go to the, the company meetings, the company um, uh, annual meetings, don't sit up with the young people in the back and t talk about how lame everyone is. You get your hind end right up in the front right in front of the podium and, and you listen to every word and when the speaker's done, hop up, shake his hand, get his business card, uh, tell him how great he was and afterwards send him a note and put him on your Christmas card list. Great advice. Absolutely. And um, I said, and go to every single workshop they have and see if you can um, perhaps give one of your own um, this person went to a uh, little presentation, and this is before the, uh, uh, what was it called, the, uh, the PowerPoint. It was before PowerPoint got popular. And he just made a, a comment how, how this would lend itself to PowerPoint. And the vice president said, oh, these lamos don't know how to do it. And he went, I'll come up and show you if you want. And he went, you do that? So he flew up to Boston on his own dime, um, went there, sh brought his laptop, showed them all how to do, it's not, at that time, it was, it's not brain science. And the vice president was so impressed. Don't you think he got major, <laughs> major points for that? He did. Today, that person is one of the top executives. Incredible. So take that early initiative. When that opportunity strikes, go for it, even if it's on your own dime. And, and treat everybody with respect mm -hmm. and you know and don't look down on uh, on women don't look down on uh, people because they're different um, like I said if, if you were in this situation I say look for Roger Brooks juniors that's that's what you want I like that I have a coach of mine a mentor uh, Dave Meltzer one of the things he advises and I'd love to get your thoughts on this is very similar to you, don't ask for anything, and, and even take it a step further. Ask them how you could be of help or service to them. Absolutely. And, and you'll be surprised how it, it actually takes people back because it's so rare for, for especially young people to ask you know, a mentor what 
they could do for them. Absolutely. And just like your example of the young man who, who did the PowerPoint, he did something for them. That's, that's taking initiative. Yeah. You agree with that? Absolutely. And also, it, uh, one of the things I found, um, and, and I grew to love, uh, I'm to the point where <laughs> I learned how to promote my own painting career, how to promote promote my own exhibits. It's called public relations promotion. And I wound up loving that as much as the artwork. So the, the last opening I had was sensation. It was mobbed um, because I had um, done a lot of advanced promotion work where I invited uh, elected dignitaries to attend and followed up. And um, also I took an ad out in the student newspaper. And um, uh, I, had beautiful invitations printed, it, it cost me. And then since this was my 20th, I wanted to make it a memorable night. I hired a student at Binghamton University who had a photo booth business who I saw presented at the Coffin uh, uh, Incubator uh, about a year ago. And he was such a nice guy that um, I wrote to him and said, are you free on May the 3rd? He was thrilled. And um, I, I helped him with his promotion, and he, he gave me a slightly reduced rate. So I had a photo booth at my... That's awesome. And, and everyone loved yeah. it. So, so what I'm trying to say is you have to learn uh, about PR. You have to learn about advertising. And I was never interested too much in that, but I grew to really love it. And it really helps your, your career and your life. The other thing that strikes me about you, Robert, is that you have figured out how to create your own reality. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. They conform to society. They conform to the norm, where all of your stories, I could see how you brought your sense of self into your work, into your life, into your family, into everything you do, creating this reality, but you have to work at it. It doesn't come to you, right? No, I, I didn't have any choice. I, 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 was, uh, I, I could have been trapped. I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed sometimes that I survived those early years, but I did. Uh, but so, so I was pretty isolated, and I can't tell you how much the reading meant to me. Uh, I, I read everything I could get my hands on. The, the library was my friend. Um, I mean, I knew the old Binghamton Public Library on Exchange Street. I, I knew that place backwards and forwards, but that's very important that you read. And um, I look at books as my friends, and I'm very, very uh, uh, inspired and soothed and um, uh, grateful to music and, uh, and ballet and... Uh, um, sculpture and poetry. I'm crazy about it. Um, in, in college, I studied, uh, I, I kind of, that was my, my uh, what I wrote my senior paper on was about modern American poetry. There was a school of poets called the Confessionals. Did you ever hear about mm -hmm. them? It was uh, Robert Lowell, uh, Adrian Rich, okay. Sylvia Plath, wow. brilliant. Uh, Ann Sexton, Theodore Rethke, John Berryman. There's more, but their work was uh, kind of like the beatniks. They were the beatniks, if you will, that, sure. of poetry, mm -hmm. and like the abstract expressionists and painting and music, Mingus. And, but uh, the, the, those confessional poets, it was exciting. It was thrilling. I mean, and they, because uh, poetry had been a very... Um, antiquated, very formal, and it was run by old white men, literally, yep. old white, and, and, and they all, uh, all were very opinionated and uh, snooty. And, and this just took it to a whole different place. Oh, it just broke the whole thing wide open. Which I'm sure led to many other people following, you know, in their footsteps and coming into their own with their poetry. Uh, there, there's a few poems that... Uh, Sylvia Plath has a poem called The Moon and the Yew Tree. Uh, she had some, some problems in her childhood. Her father died when she was very young. I think she blamed herself for his death, uh, poor thing. And yeah. this is before mental health uh, 
awareness and all advanced. that. Advanced. Yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, she was married, and her husband, also a poet, um, saw how depressed she was, and he didn't know what to do, so he suggested out their picture window was a yew tree. It's a tree in England. He, he said, why don't you write a poem about the yew tree? So, so at that time, he was the, the, the big male poet uh, star. So she wrote that poem in two days and gave it to him, and, and he just looked at it, and he realized, looking at the, she was her fame was going to eclipse his someday. And it is such a perfect poem. It, it takes poetry to a whole nother level. Like she's talking about a church and you can hear the, the bells ringing. Mm. It's, it, I highly recommend it. If you'd like, I'll send you the link. Please, yeah, we'll, and, we'll post it in the show notes. And, and there's, there's so many other forms of, of art uh, that are, um, and this is something that we can tell the young people. There, there's just so much out there that you can learn. And like I said, if you don't like it, right. you know, I have to. <laughs> right. But you have to be willing to do the work, right? The research. Yeah. Take the time. Uh, spend less time watching TV. Do more reading. Do more reading poetry. Yeah. Um, one day when I first moved here, I was in the Lost Dog uh, Cafe. I... I had met Marie and I had met Liz and Nicole. I really didn't know them very well, but I was sitting at the bar and they plugged my laptop in and I was just sitting there and the girl next to me was, was going like, <laughs> and so I didn't know her and I said, what, what's the matter? And she said, I've got a final tomorrow. And I said, what's it on? <laughs> and she said, modern American poetry. And I went, and, and she said, well, we can bring our notebooks into class. She goes, I, I, she was practically in tears. So I said, who are the poets you have to cover? She said, T.S. Eliot. I, went, I had my laptop, T.S. Eliot. So I was just telling her. Showing her, yeah. Just like today with you, I was just telling her my anecdotes, my little stories. And I said, what else? And, and she'd give me another one. And she also had Edgar Allan Poe, who happens to be, a lot of people don't know, is one of the greatest writers that ever lived. Oh, yeah. It's just the reason he's known for his uh, uh, horror stories. That was at the beginning of book publishing in our country. That's the only thing that sold. Or there wasn't anything it's else out there. It's the only thing that right, sold. Right. Uh, and so, but he's actually one, a great writer. So, so I'm, she's writing everything down. <laughs> and it's, we sat there, we went through her list, and she was taking copious notes. Well, um, uh, in effect, it was like a little mini class for her. Um, we weren't cheating. I was just giving Helping her my her, life. Sure. Well, so the next time I saw her, about a, about, a, about a month later, I said, how did it go? She said, I got an A. Wow. And I went, ah, right. So to this day, whenever we see each other, we hug each other. That's neat. Great story. Yeah. Great story. No, great, great advice. You say for people to get over themselves. Explain that a little bit, because a lot of, you know, it's kind of a, a term you hear, but what does it really mean for someone to get over themselves? It, it means pretend you're an Etch-a-Sketch toy and shake it and get rid of all that crap and start over. Especially the ego. Everything, everything. And, and that's what my work is all about. It's called reinventing yourself. And that's why my exhibit was called Divinely Diverse. I don't want to keep doing the same thing. I want to keep shaking that Etch-a-Sketch machine. Uh, but for, for people that need to get over themselves are just too trapped up in, like you said, ego. And, set in their ways. And set in their ways and just, they're, they're probably depressed. And, and um, some of them are so frustrated that, that they lash out and are mean to people. So, so when I say get over yourself, I mean, you really need to, uh, who, who's that wacky diet guy? Richard Simmons, yes. Project Me. Yeah. He had the right idea. Yeah. Project Me. Yep. Like, how can I make myself a better person? Yeah. I ask, my, I ask myself that every day. I want to read one more thing to you. All unbalanced emotions and reactions um, 
dissatisfaction, irritation, anxiety, worry, depression, confusion, despair, fear, pity, dependency, lust, oversensitivity, admiration, delight, disappointment, pride, conceit, contempt, repulsion, resentment, and so on, are all the result of overstating the importance of things. The importance of overstating? Uh, over, overstating the importance of, of things in general. Of Just things. Yeah, don't, don't, don't overstate the importance of anything because it's only here in our mind that we're, we're creating that overimportance. Um, and this guy talks about pendulums, you know, swinging. Don't go too far any way, you know, because that's radical behavior. So he says, pendulums hook you on these strings and turn you into a puppet. Dropping importance does not mean battling with your feelings and trying to suppress them. It means addressing the cause, the underlying attitude. You have to reach the point where you can see the, that importance leads to nothing but trouble. Then deliberately reduce the importance you attribute to things. So really just don't give anything too much importance, whether, and, and I think that includes yourself. You know, we're, yeah. we're no more important than anyone else. Just like you said, in the workplace, treat everyone equal. It doesn't matter if they're a vendor from Tennessee or it doesn't matter. You know, people are people, man, woman, young, old. Well, uh, it, it's interesting as you were saying, I was, little ideas were popping up. Like, like when I uh, was talking about the vendors, the business partners. Um, keep in mind, I was the number one spender at the company. I had the biggest budget because I bought paper. You know how much that costs? Sure. I bought pre-press. I, I, I bought printing. You know how much printing costs? So, so very often when they liked me so much and I was in there and had a r rapport with them, I, I'd be stuck there for four or five days <laughs> At board out of my mind, so I'd go in and talk to them, and they'd say, you, know, you may want to go back and talk to them about doing this little idea. It would probably save you like a uh, hundred grand a year. So I'd be like, <laughs> you know, so I'd write it down, and that happened a lot. So I'd go back to the uh, to New York and go back to my boss, and he'd say, I, I'd like you to come to the management meeting and talk about this. We would do it. So, so because I was... Uh, uh, open, uh, they would give me ideas. And, and, and those little 75 grand, 100 grand, those little things, Adds they up. add up at the end of the a year. Absolutely. Where, where I would win an award at the end of the year. Incredible. <laughs> you know, I, I've got all kinds of things on my wall. But uh, it, it's, it's just good business. And, and uh, um, one of the pressmen at R.R. R. Donnelly in um, uh, Danville, Kentucky, just passed away. Oh. And, and I sent his wife a uh, card, and I was hoping she wouldn't take it wrong. I said, he had the sweetest smile. You know, I, I, I had never met her. She wrote back. She loved it. She said, he sure did. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so, yeah. so it, it's just, um, um, I, I think travel is good, too, for, for a person. But, but, but yeah, just uh, opening up Makes yourself. Makes more worldly, Absolutely. So look, this has been phenomenal. We've had uh, just a great conversation. We could go on for hours, you know. I just feel like we could sit down and talk for hours. And, well, and so we shall. Absolutely. A um, couple more questions for you. What's next for you? You mentioned that this may be your last exhibit. I, I want to know why. What, what's happening? Um, I did 20 of the first Fridays. They're... they're <clears throat> almost always at a restaurant. And, uh, you know, um, people accidentally put an elbow in. Um, one time, a couple of times, but drinks got splashed on them. Uh, I was always able to repair them, except the, the elbow I couldn't. But um, uh, it's just, um, I feel I, I accomplished what I wanted to. So if, if I do anything in the future, it'll be perhaps at a gallery the galleries in Binghamton are only open like one day a week or two days a week. So, so it might not be in Binghamton. Uh, it, it might be in Syracuse. It might be down in New York or wherever. Um, but right now I'm retired. And for the first time in my life, I'm really and truly happy. And 
again, I got an open slate. I shook that extra sketch, and I'm open for anything. And um, I, I've got a lot of books. I had that book uh, by uh, Pete, uh, see how I, how I pronounce this, uh, Pete Betajudge. And I started, it's tr he's really smart, uh, really with it. And I've got another um, three or four books I'm reading all at once. So, and also I, I got good at cooking. I, I brought you. Right, yes, you guys, thank you for the cookies. <laughs> the peanut butter crisscross. Well, half of Binghamton is going to know what, what you're talking about. They're really good. Yes. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to talk about was the, the wellness program that I'm on. Please. Um, yeah. Well, I mentioned that I used to be a big beer drinker because I loved it. I, I, still, <laughs> I still dream about it. And I, I, I would drink a beer and... It, it, I'd hear bells ringing, and, and there's that good beer burp, you know, right. and it goes good with food. And, uh, but uh, I, I got on a Weight Watchers program, and, and I really had to lose some weight because I had put it on, and um, everybody has problems. And so what I said for the first time, okay, age 16 to age 62, I've been drinking nonstop. I, I, Who's good at math? 62 minus 16, 40 some years. So, so I said, I'm gonna put that aside and I'm gonna commit myself to really getting myself, it's gonna take a couple years. So what I did was I had tons and tons of seltzer since I was a beer drinker. Bubbles, bubbles, tons. And, uh, and I, I didn't have any kind of withdrawal or anything, but um, all of a sudden, after a couple weeks, I started to feel better. My, my skin felt better. The, the skin on my legs felt better. I slept better. And then my blood pressure, in addition to the weight, the blood pressure started going down, and I just felt better about myself. Did you quit completely, or did you just cut down? And No, oh no, I, I committed to abstaining, total abstaining. I was so motivated to lose that weight. And I, I think you'll get an idea when I'm motivated, get out of my yes. way. So no, I, I said, I'm gonna not drink anything until I lose. I'm not even gonna tell you how much weight, it was a lot. So, um, so after about a month, I started to tell my friends, a few of my close friends, I said, you know, I really have to think about this. So I talked to my healthcare professional and he said, uh, that's interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure your body is, is, has a big sigh of relief. So after t a couple more months, I told my friends, "This is it. I'm done with it." Wonderful. I, so it's been three years now. That, uh, Congratulations. You know, thank that, well, that's well, awesome. Well, no one told me that I, I had to. So there was <laughs> like sure. no intervention. Right. It was purely. But the fact that you did it and and it's become now you know, part of your life. And, and uh, it, I kind of had an epiphany too. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I haven't gone to any meetings or anything, but it's one of the reasons why I'm working on the essay for kids. They don't have to, you don't have to get all messed up on alcohol or whatever. You don't, you don't have to, you know, it's not necessary. You have so much more spending money too, I remember, because you, you get paid and go out and paint the town red, and you're broke to the next. So, but, but the wellness program is also where you go every six months back to the, I go to UHS, I have a real nice guy named Scott Rossman, uh, and you, uh, once a year you have your blood tested, and you exercise. For right now, uh, I walk a day, every day for one hour with, with music. And, real mindful of my steps and traffic and stuff. And um, uh, your diet, so I got better at, at uh, cooking. I, I try to uh, not eat processed foods. Yeah. I make everything fresh. Makes such a difference, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, there's more to the wellness program than that, but th that's the main thing. Like, I cut down on alcohol, or I mean, I eliminated alcohol. I uh, lost weight, I exercise. And so it's a combination of everything. And there's so many resources that I could go to. Like if you have a real serious problem, you can go to their mental health uh, 
division on the basement, meet with a social worker, and, the, and they'll talk it out. There's nothing wrong with that. Sure. Yeah. So, but the, there are so many resources. There's, there's hotlines 24-7 that you can call. <clears throat> so I've been really, um, really happy and gratified. That Fantastic. Everything's worked out so well. If you were to take out your cell phone right now and call the 20-year-old Robert, what would you tell him? Don't drink. Don't drink and, uh, and... Easier said than done though, right? How, how do you, when you say that to a 20 year old, they're gonna say, come on, Uncle Bob. Well I, well, I, well, I would have to say, don't drink dot, dot, dot. You'll have so much more spending money. You still can have a little bit, but don't drink in excess. And watch out for the buttes of the world. Watch out for users. Like I had a couple real beautiful real buttes that they were real um, uh, users and, uh, and um, don't let people hurt you and reach out for help. Love it. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, I ask every guest the, the same last question. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What do you want your legacy to be? What do I want my legacy to be? Uh, well, um, that, that I was uh, a gentleman and um, that um, I made people laugh and, um, uh, and, and I was a good friend. Robert Hoover, <laughs> welcome to the American Real Family. Well, thank thank you. you so much for doing this and thank you for sharing your story. It, it's it, fascinating. It's in encouraging, inspiring, and I cannot wait to share it to the world. All right. Well, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to American Real. Be sure to visit our website, AmericanReal.tv, or search for us on iTunes or YouTube for past episodes. While you're there, please rate us or leave us a review, as that helps others find our show. I am truly grateful and appreciate all of your support. At American Real, we're on a mission to help as many people around the world fulfill their dreams and obtain their goals. If you'd like to be part of our inner circle or want one-on-one -on -one coaching, check out the American Real Learning Academy, where we have self-help groups and courses so you can build the best you. We also have a new Facebook group where you can connect with high achievers from around the world. If you want to go even further, Maybe you're determined to write your own book or launch your own podcast. Contact me today to see if we could help. You can reach me through Instagram or Facebook or email me directly at roger at americanreal.tv. And speaking of podcasting, our next course will be starting soon. So if you're interested in launching your own podcast, join me and podcast your passion. I'll take you through my eight-week course where I'll mentor you to build a world-class podcast. I'm only taking on a small group of people who want to share their passion through broadcasting, where I'll have you up on iTunes and YouTube within weeks so you can podcast your passion. Click on the link below for more information. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.